Barbara, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and uh, uh, thanks to Politics and Prose for providing this uh, wonderful forum over the years. And uh, to C-SPAN, who's here tonight, to bring it, this uh, event to a, a slightly larger audience, uh, I want to thank my publisher, Farrar Strauss and Giroux, and its president, Jonathan Galassi, who, uh, who funded this project and gave me a wonderful editor, and Paul Eli, who was a senior editor at Farrar. Uh, was instrumental in, in bringing the book to the market, and Laurel Cook, who, who is handling the publi publicity on the book and doing a wonderful job. Um, and I want to thank all of you all for coming out the, this evening on such a bitter, cold evening. I regret to inform you that when you go out, it'll be 10 degrees lower than when you came in. Uh, we arrive here tonight uh, with the promise of, um, of a new era in the Middle East. Uh, the only problem is no one has any idea what it's going to be. Um, there's a feeling, I think, in Washington and kind of in the, in the country and certainly out in the region of amazement, and not least of which because you had the President of the United States the other day with uh, my friend the Hisham Mellum in the Oval Office giving an interview to Al Arabiya uh, Television, the Arab Satellite Channel, as his first interview. And it was kind of an outreach uh, to the Muslim world that says we want to do business in it with a different tone of mutual respect. Uh, we still got some tough issues to, uh, to face, but uh, uh, we want to change the tone. Um, and at the same time, you have amazement, you have this great sense of peril because we've just come through the uh, Gaza operation, which caused uh, such uh, uh, great destruction uh, <clears throat> along the Mediterranean coastline where uh, uh, more than a million uh, Palestinians live in a very narrow strip uh, in, in very tough uh, conditions. and, and uh, at the same time, they've got a leadership that is bent on the destruction of uh, Israel and has been firing rockets off its shoulders uh, and terrorizing about 100,000 uh, Israelis that live within the arc of that, uh, of, of that fire, rocket fire. And um, it's not uh, easy for the president to uh, coming into office. Uh, we have no idea whether he uh, will be able to succeed to restart negotiations, whether he'll be able to get the Palestinian community to unify so that there's a partner on the other side. George Mitchell is already out in the region. He's had some meetings. Uh, we have no idea what the result of that uh, trip is yet. Uh, uh, but I think it's safe to say that uh, though the president uh, uh, put his finger on a very tough, very experienced negotiator in selecting George Mitchell, it's not going to be George Mitchell who is going to do the hard work uh, if there are going to be any, any movement in this first term of the Obama presidency. It will have to be Obama, and it, won't, uh, it certainly won't be easy. Um, expectations could not be higher. Uh, my book, uh, A World of Trouble, is a, a history of American presidents since Eisenhower trying to get their arms around the region and the very uneven uh, record they have for uh, uh, success uh, and engagement. Um, none of them has had an easy time. For 60 years they've been trying to make peace or just to stop the recurrent wars that have racked the region. Um, the record of success is thin, and the reason, one of the reasons, is self-evident. Each president has wanted to distinguish himself from his predecessor, but uh, there's a more subtle explanation in that American foreign policy in the Middle East has no overarching imperative of national security similar to what drove us during the Cold War. Um, the intensity of that threat of mutual nuclear annihilation uh, focused our uh, attention uh, on the basic fundamentals, uh, first and foremost uh, diplomatic engagement with the enemy, and uh, secondly holding together a Western alliance structure that could solidify uh, the West around a policy that contained the, the threat and engaged it at the same time. In the Middle East, Middle East was kind of a backwater at the end of World War II. I mean, we have interests in the Middle East, oil uh, being uh, prominent among them, uh, interest in keeping the lines of communication open through Suez with that great uh, hinge of the continents uh, leads us uh, to the Asian markets. Uh, interest in managing the emergence of Israel and the security of Israel over the years and minimizing its, uh, any destabilization of the region. Uh, interest in controlling the arms race, including uh, the, the spread of nuclear weapons, and, and in interest in fostering uh, development. Eisenhower was really the first to see that because Eisenhower understood, I think, uh, first that uh, 
development and prosperity was was the single thing that could tame most effectively the fires of grievance and anger that was roiling in the region at the end of the war. So my book is a narrative about how each uh, president engaged the region. I've drawn from uh, many sources, and there are some. There's a rich archive now that has been declassified over the last uh, 20 years. One of the most recent things is the the full scope of Henry Kissinger's telephone conversations, which run to about 20,000 pages, in which the National Security Archive here in town, which is based at George Washington University, has very skillfully collated and computerized and indexed and whatnot, and made it available uh, for researchers and. On top of that, you have the memcons, the memoranda of conversation between presidents and foreign leaders that have, uh, uh, to a large extent, been declassified in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And uh, I, when I set out to do this research, I, I understood that if you could gather up all the nuggets, the cumulative calculus of, of declassifications and leaks and memoirs and whatnot, that you could stitch together a narrative that would feel novelistic. In other words, you could bring the reader into the room when LBJ was literally down here in the UPI machine at the first hours of the Six-Day War, reading the dispatches as they came out of the print head. He lifted it up like a car hood, stick his head in there, because <laughs> he wanted to get at the news faster. Uh, the, uh, um, I just want to uh, take, take a, a few minutes to, to kind of talk about each one of the presidents and my impressions of, of what they encountered. You know, Eisenhower came into office as there was a great awakening going on at the, uh, in the period after the creation of Israel, the end of the war, the Arab nationalism, pan-Arabism, Nasser came to power in Egypt and got on Radio Cairo and just had the region in thrall with this new message of unity of the Arabs and confronting the colonialists, the imperialists, and doing something about the Zionist entity over there that took our lands. And he didn't have very many options, and, but, but he stood just a few years removed from the creation of those multilateral institutions that we helped create at the end of the war, the United Nations, whose charter spoke of those principles of the, you know, the non-acceptability uh, of conquest in, in reconciling conflict and, and whatnot. And he looked out at the at the region uh, roiled by all these forces and realized that the competition really with the Soviet Union was going to be about hearts and minds uh, for these peoples in this part of the world and that the United States had to p set itself aside from the colonial past of the European powers and had to reach out with a kind of a magnanimous uh, spirit to, to the region, t totally out of self-interest, not for any sentimental reasons. Um, Eisenhower because he had been a war commander, the supreme allied commander, and was used to dealing in continental-sized thoughts, looked at the refugee problem after the creation of Israel. You have 700,000 Arabs living in camps there from in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan. Gaza and the West Bank were in the hands of Jordan and Egypt, respectively, and said, why don't we do what we did in the Tennessee Valley? Let's take hydroelectric power into the arid hills of the West Bank and the Jordan Valley and build dam projects that will green the hills of the region and draw those refugees out onto farms where they have the prospect of, of a new life, with, uh, raise their children, etc. And peace will break out and the problem will be solved. Uh, and it was a great, uh, it was a great big thought. Uh, and it was just, uh, the problem was it was overcome by, overcome by the events of the fast moving events of the time, and soon Nasser had, uh, was buying arms, had thrown in with the Soviets, and uh, the crisis over uh, the Aswan Dam and then the Suez Canal in 1956 kind of threw a spanner in all of Eisenhower's works. When uh, President Kennedy was, dur during his transition, after his election in November of 1960, and be before he took the oath of office, learned that the, uh, Israel was sec secretly building a a reactor complex in the Negev Desert that would be capable of, build, of, of producing uh, atomic weapons uh, in the future. And he, he was um, uh, frustrated, uh, especially uh, uh, as, as time went on and especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis.